My name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the Executive Director for Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. Today is Saturday, January 22nd, 2022. Sir, what is your name? Gary Frischette. Okay, Gary. And um, what branch of the service were you in? United States Air Force. What year did you go in? I went in in August 1968, right after grad high school graduation. What city do you live in? I lived in, at the time, Newton, Massachusetts. Presently, I live in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Okay. And you said, I think you said you went in 1968? 1968. Where were you at the time? Uh, in, in Newton, Massachusetts, where my uh, family grew up, my hometown. Graduated from high school in June, and uh, in August, I was at basic training. What, what school was that? Newton South High School. Got it. Um, why did you choose the branch of the Air Force that you were in? I mean, the branch of service, sorry. Well, it's funny, a funny story. My father, um, I came home with my high school diploma and I said, I graduated from high school. He said, congratulations, you got 30 days and you're out of the house. I said, 30 days? He goes, yeah, figure it out. I can't send you to college, you know, I'm a policeman, I don't make money, so you have to figure it out, son. So I went up the street, my best buddy walked out of his house and I said, what's the matter? He said, my dad gave me 30 days. I said, we need to think of, we got draft numbers, but let's go, let's go talk to a recruiter. And the first office we went to was the Air Force. Okay. Walked in and, uh, and he, the recruiter said, okay, great, we'll take you. You guys look great, high school diplomas, no problem. Well, when, uh, when can you go? I said, I got to go by July the 6th. I got 30 days. He goes, I can't take you in 30 days. I can do August, but I can't do 30. Uh -huh. I said, would you call my dad and give, give, see if he'll let me stay another 30? <laughs> And he laughed and he did. It was a quite a memory we had about that. Right. So where, where was uh, where was basic training? Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. And uh, what was that like? What were your instructors like? Our instructors were were tough. Um, one was a Native American Indian, and the other was a um, gentleman from Alabama who both had served two tours in Vietnam. And then when they came back, they became drill instructors. Okay. So, um, where did you go for tech school? Um, I was what they call on-the-job training. I left Lackland and I went to Hamilton Air Force Base in California. My MOS was security police officer, and um, so I started learning on the job there. Wow. How long was that training? Uh, it took me about maybe three months, and then they let me on my own. I was on my own. Twelve weeks? What do you mean on your own? Well, I didn't have to be with anybody. Uh, I could ride in a patrol car by myself, work the main gate, uh, and then on the security side, walk the flight line, stuff like that. Nice. And um, Okay, so that was in, in your security training? That was in my security training, That's... and then um, they were looking for volunteers to go to be a canine handler. Oh. So they sent me back to Lackland, where I went to canine school, and uh, then I was now a security police canine handler. Got my dog. Okay, so where was your first duty base? Well, it still was Hamilton Air Force Base in San Francisco. I went back mm -hmm. with my dog, and I would say it must have been about four months later and got orders to go to uh, Southeast Asia, Thailand. Mm -hmm. And what year was that again? Uh, that would have been right after the Tet Offensive, so it was just 1970. How long were you there on, in, in Thailand? Um, I did 12 months. Okay. Um, what was your job there? The uh, job was a security police uh, dog handler. Uh, our primary function was to, our, our patrol dogs were not vicious dogs, they were only on command. And our job was to patrol the fence line uh, around the uh, Air Force bases and outside the fence line. And at times they would put us on helicopters and maybe take us to areas where a plane had crashed and they wanted extra uh, security for, until they could get stuff off that plane. Right. Speaking of casualties, um, through, through basic training, through your security training, through the training with, the, um, with your canine, were there any casualties up to, up to that point? No casualties up to that point until I got to Thailand. And then, uh, then it started. What started? Well, we had, uh, in all of the countries over there, uh, some parts of the population believed in communism and believed in a different 
form of government. So we had what we call Thai communists. That would they were like guerrilla warfare uh, insurgents that would attack the base, uh, maybe throw grenades. No outright strong attacks, but enough to just keep us on our toes. Anybody get hurt? Yeah, we had we had a couple of uh, uh, canine handlers that that got hurt. Nobody died, but their injuries were enough that they were sent back to the states. How did they get injured? Um, a grenade, a shrapnel. Uh, that's what they kind of walked into. Our dogs were tattooed in the right ear. Right ear. Mm -hmm. All military dogs have a tattoo, and. Uh, the communists, even in Vietnam, even more so, if anybody brought them a hand, uh, a tattooed ear from a canine, it was like a bounty. You could make some money. Just how many types and kinds, or how often did you have any any engagements like that? Oh, maybe once, twice a month. Um, most of the time, it was. Uh, a hit and run. They would hit and then run. I mean, it wasn't like they wanted to stay and fight. Um, we would outnumber them. We also had the Thai military with us on the base. Um, so they, they would respond first because off the base we weren't allowed to carry weapons in Thailand. And speaking of which, when you would go, I guess, um, you know, on weekend pass or whatever and interact with the, the civilians, what did that entail? What was that like? Um, for me, it was pretty good. When I first got to my first base in Thailand called Tak Lee, um, we um, were allowed to go downtown. We would ride a bus, um, what they call a bot bus. Bot was their currency. Small little bus, pick you outside the gate and you'd go downtown. Um, at, and you could stay overnight as long as you weren't reporting for duty. Um, and it was um, interesting for me because after about, I think, three weeks, I started teaching at a school where they had orphans. Um, most of the children were um, what we call Amerasian, um, and they're not wanted by their families. If a girl was pregnant by an American GI, uh, that child usually was not allowed to be brought up in the village or the areas, and they were uh, in, sent to an orphanage that was run by the uh, uh, Archdiocese, it was a Catholic. And I went there to teach the kids English, and they taught me more Thai. This was kind of fun. <coughs> How was the food? Food was spicy. If you like <laughs> spicy and hot food, the Thais know how to do that. Um, they had a Thai chili that <laughs> I couldn't take. <laughs> I was never a spicy kind of guy. Okay. And so, during that tour, that was, I think you said, how long was that tour in, well, in Thailand? Uh, one year, so one, 12 months. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, tell me, outside of what you already told me, two more of the most memorable incidences that you experienced throughout that tour. Well, there were two. Uh, no, I had an appendicitis attack. Uh, my appendix ruptured at night with my dog. Um, and I passed out. Um, I guess, as all animals do, they sense something was wrong. And he started barking and barking and barking which brought other handlers over to me, and they, I was passed out. They diagnosed me with a uh, appendicitis that had ruptured. They flew me to a hospital where they, they got it, cleaned it out. Um, but uh, my stomach was so ripped up from that that I couldn't go back to canine. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't give me a dog anymore. So they assigned me to town patrol. And town patrol was you, I would ride with a Thai police officer, uh, not, not armed, he was, and um, that's kind of what would happen. Before that, I got stuck in a tunnel with my dog, which wasn't really kind of a pleasure. At the time, you're young, you don't realize it, but then you realize how it affects you later in life. My dog was going in to check these tunnels. They would sometimes try and dig tunnels, and we would send the dog in, and my dog was one of the smallest ones that we had. Mm -hmm. She was skinny, so she would go, and all of a sudden I heard a yelp and she got caught. I couldn't pull her out the leash, so I went in to go see if I could get her out. Well, then I got stuck. So it took about two and a half, almost three hours for the team to get us both out of that tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of sticks with you for a little bit. Well, actually, now it does for a long time. Mm -hmm. I never realized why I can't do certain things or be certain. Don't put me in a CAT scan. We're going to fight unless you give me some happy juice. 
things like that really kind of play 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 with you. But those are the two most memorable most memorable things. So the other one was that I wanted to adopt a little four year old boy and bring him home. Mm -hmm. But my mom and dad didn't think it was a good idea. No. For a nineteen year old to bring home a little boy. Right. So, how long were you in the service, by the way, all together? All together, four years. So okay. Four. All right, all right. Um, where was your next tour? Um, after, uh, well, Tuckley, they um, turned that base over to the Royal Thai Air Force, so all Americans had to leave. So they sent us up to a place called NKP, Mekong Phnom, which was in the Chiang Mai area of Thailand on the north, um, either northeast coast. Um, beautiful, beautiful area, but highly volatile, um, and that's why we went there. After I left there, they sent me home to Westover Air Force Base in Massachusetts. Okay. So, um, how long were you at this, at, at this next, the one after Thailand? <laughs> well, the funny, I mean, in Westover, what I was, I was back being a dog handler again. This time my dog was a marijuana detection dog, too. Well, now you're talking about Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. So my dog could smell marijuana, and he was doing a good job of it. So good that guys took it out on me and keyed up my car, uh, you know, same stuff like that. So the base commander said, uh, said we're going to sh ship you out of here. It's not good for you. Your okay. dog's doing great. You're doing great. But we're going to send you to Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod. I said, wow, Cape Cod, I'll take it. <laughs> what am I going to do there? And they said, you're just going to work at a alert facility where we have four KC-135 refuelers. That's the plane that refuels everything in midair. Right. And they're on alert. So you're just going to hang with the lieutenant colonel there and be his little do boy or whatever he needs. <laughs> I said, okay. And now that's where I finished out my career there. Before you left um, uh, Asia, um, were there any other incidences? Um, well, one that kind of shocked me, uh, I was with my sergeant, his name was Sergeant Tanam, I still remember his name. Right. We were driving an American, I was driving an American Jeep, he was beside me. A little lady ahead of us in the town near the market came out screaming, Menda, Menda, which is a thief, thief, thief. Uh -huh. And the guy was running with some stuff that he had in his hand. Uh -huh. And Tanam said, stop the Jeep. I said, okay. I stopped. He took out, he got out, took his revolver and shot the guy mm -hmm. right in the street. He put his revolver away, got back in the Jeep and said, let's go. I said, Tanam, what about report, ambulance? And he goes, no, he's a thief. And the lady went over and took her stuff, and the beggars will just be strip him and throw his body in the river. I said, I'm kind of not used to that. You know, that's not how we do it in America. He goes, well, that's the way we do it in Thailand. So, I'm looking at the, uh, at your, at your jacket. Yeah. And um, I see you, uh, you were a prisoner of war? No, that's an honorable prisoner of war. That, okay. that, that is one we wear in honor of all prisoner of wars. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else do you have? I see you have your patrol dog. I have my patrol dog one. Um, I have my, uh, when I was at uh, NKP and uh, up in Thailand. And, and then we, we wear these vests. This is a, a VFW. I'm in part of the VFW post in Lake Park, Florida. Oh, okay. We have a motorcycle group. So we wear, this is what we call our colors, uh -huh. not Hell's Angels or any of the bad guys, uh -huh. but we wear these when we go to fundraisers, we do the big time uh, gather Christmas presents for kids, we do a motor, my bike run, and uh, that's it, kind of. Right. We do that. Nice, very nice. Yeah. Um, let's see. How was, um, let me, um, so, okay, overall, well, first of all, um, why, okay, so why are you in the service, number one? Did you ever have any problems staying in touch with your family back home? No. Um, it was always pretty simple for us. It was not a problem. When we went to Thailand, you couldn't use a phone, um, and you could write letters, but the majority of us had these, I mean, you remember the good old little cassette tapes? Yeah. And that's what we would use. I'd record something on the tape, send it home. Uh -huh. They would all sit down and listen to it. Right. And then they would all say some stuff, and we'd let me know what's up, and send it back. <laughs> so it's nice. kind of a, you think of the technology today right. with Zoom and, and chat and all that stuff. And we kind of had to wait a few weeks before we could hear one another. Right. It was on the tape. Right. Yeah. Um, did you, by the way, did you... Um, 
Did you ever go to, did you go to school while you ran? Did you get, when did you get your degree? Oh, I got my degree when I came home. Um, I, I, I got out of the Air Force and went to work with the federal, U.S. Federal Protective Service, which was the uniform branch of the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And I was stationed at the Kennedy Building in Boston. And the two gentlemen that I had to protect when they were there were uh, Teddy Kennedy and Tip O'Neill. And at that point, um, one of the aides said, you know, you should start thinking about getting your college degree. The VA will pay for it. The vet, you got the veteran veteran. That's what's wondering if you used your GI Bill. I did. I used the GI Bill here in Florida. I went to Palm Beach Junior College at the time. Right. I got a degree in law enforcement. And the VA said, well, you can change your degree if you want and get more money. I said, okay. So I got a degree in public relations. Uh -huh. And then I went to Fort Lauderdale Business College, which was right here in downtown West Palm. And I got a degree in business administration. Okay. All paid for by the veterans. So it was that your bachelor's degree or your master's? That was my bachelor. Okay. I never, you uh -huh. see, I never went for the master. Okay. Um, so do you, you feel like while you were in the military that you had, that the Air Force supplied you with all the... Everything you needed, supplies? For me, they gave me everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, I don't know if it was the Air Force or just because it was that branch, but I always felt uh, accepted. I always felt uh, rewarded. Um, I never had any problems. Um, I think my biggest mistake in the Air Force was getting out, to be honest with you. I think that's a... I think that's something that a lot of veterans think about. God, I should have stayed in, you know. <laughs> but we're young. You don't think about it. Uh, my mom and dad were both police officers. So I said, no, nah, I'm going to get out of the Air Force and be a cop. Right. Which I did. That was the majority of my career. Right. Okay, so what year did you come out of the service? 1972. Did you do your reserve? I did two years of reserve. Where? Uh, Hanscom Field in Massachusetts. Okay. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so, okay, so you're out of the service now, and what was the first job that you had? Uh, the United States Federal Protective Service, uniform branch of the Secret how, Service. How long were you with them? Uh, actually, I was with them two years. Uh, the second year, I was never a snow baby. I didn't like the cold, and there was an advertisement that said there's two job openings, one in Miami and one in West Palm Beach. And I said, I'll take the one for West Palm Beach. So I moved me and my wife and the baby at the time here to West Palm Beach. And I was working at the Rogers Federal Building, right down, right down here, to, not too far away. Uh -huh. And then a gentleman came over from the West Palm Beach Police Department, a lieutenant post, and said, "Hey, would you like to join us?" And I went, "Heck yeah!" From so, from West Palm? Yeah. The okay. West, so I went on the West Palm Beach Police Department, where I stayed five years. Okay. All right. And then went to work with, went to work at the school board. Yes. Oh. The school board at that point hired. Certified officers, mm -hmm. but it was a new program, a federal grant. What year was that? Uh, it had to be 73, 1978. 1978. Okay, yeah. all right. And how long were you with the West Palm Police Department? Five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, now you've been in, after the Air Force, you became a federal officer. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you... A municipal officer here in, in West Palm. In West Palm. Okay, so um, in, as far as engaging the community, um, crime, um, incidents of violence, any interaction, what would, what did, what was your overall experience up to this point? You know, regarding dealing with the community. Well, my best experience, uh, Chief Billy Barnes was the chief of police. He didn't like Yankees, and the first he hired a buddy, a friend of mine. We were both. One from Pennsylvania, me from Massachusetts. So he hired us. He goes, I don't like Yankees, but we'll see how you do. <laughs> Went to the academy, and my first job was right here on Rosemary Avenue. Okay. Back then, from 1st Street to 10th Street, Rosemary Avenue was the was a tough tough area. Mm -hmm. And you worked it from 7 at night to 3 in the morning, and you walked. Oh, really? And so that made me feel like, wow, this is so cool. This is nice. I mean, they didn't hate us. They they weren't disrespectful. Uh, they appreciated what we were trying to do. Um, my first interaction was there's a liquor store near the railroad tracks, and the gentleman would come out, get out of work on Friday, and throw the bones. They start playing dice, and uh, so I would I walked around the corner one night and I went boo, and they went oh man, officer, we're sorry. I said, well, whose money is that? I don't know. 
Who's, whose dice is that? I don't know. So I took the dice and I took the money and there were six little kids, maybe eight, nine, ten years old, and I called them over and I gave them all the money. And I don't know how much it was, but I gave it to them. Right. I kept the dice. And, and everybody looked at that like, what is this guy trying to do? Well, they went and had fun, whatever they did. And after that, every night I'd go down on Friday night, the little kids would come up to me and say, hey, you want to know where they're throwing the bones? <laughs> And you know, that's when I realized what community policing was all about. My dad always told me, if you're going to go into law enforcement, treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Always remember that, son. He always, that stuck in my head. And I carried that through my whole law enforcement career. Okay. Okay, so, um, you, so five years, West Palm. Where'd you, where, where'd you go after that? I went to the school board. Um, the school board was hiring uh, guys to, uh, you know, Get, interact with the kids. We weren't armed, but we were special deputies. Okay. My first assignment was Jupiter High School, uh -huh. and I walked in there, and I'm kind of like, what do I do here? I went into the gym, and the kids were doing square dancing, mm -hmm. and <laughs> they weren't dancing. They just sat down. They weren't going to square dance. Oh. Well, I had a part-time job at a place called the Boardwalk, uh -huh. Palm Beach Lakes and Congress, which was a little, little, little discotheque. Okay. And I was a bouncer. So right. I decided to take up disco dancing, which I did. And so I went to the PE teacher and said, hey, do you mind if I teach the kids disco instead of square dancing? He said, anything to get them active. So we did. I started teaching disco dancing to the kids. From that, they would talk to you. They'd open up. Mm -hmm. And that's what the purpose of the, quote, school resource officer was all about. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. How long were you with the school district? Oh, let's see, I think I was with them for maybe four years, five years. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Drug Abuse Treatment Association data, okay. where I became the executive director. Um, at the school board, I was the drug education, quote, expert. Uh -huh. So, which meant that um, I would uh, go to kindergarten, all the way kindergarten to 12th grade. I remember Superintendent Tom Mills said to me, Gary, why are you going to kindergarten? I said, there's a good program by the federal government called Only Sick People Need Drugs. I said, Mr. Superintendent, these kids in kindergarten know the slang. They know the terminology. He goes, how do you know? I said, well, just come and watch. So I would go into the kindergarten classroom, and they thought I was G.I. Joe. I had a little beard. And uh -huh. I looked like that G.I. Joe action figure. Because okay. so, they couldn't say Frechette real good. Because every time they said the word Frechette, they put a dirty word on the end of my name. So it was free shit. So I said, I can't do that. So G.I. Joe. And then I said, hey kids, would you raise your hand and tell me a good drug? And they'd raise their hand and go, vitamins, aspirin. Oh, only if your mom and dad gave you very good. Okay, kids, what about, are there any bad drugs? And one little, these little kids raised reefer. My mom's got some reefer at home. You know, hey, cocaine, I know what cocaine is. And he's a five-year-old, a little baby. So that's when the superintendent said, oh my God, you're doing the right thing. Keep it up. So did that and so my career was great I was busting people for drugs and then I went into teaching kids about drugs now I had the opportunity to treat kids that had a drug problem uh -huh. and that's when I became the executive director of data okay how long were you with them uh, almost seven years I stayed uh, involved in law enforcement I was a part-time lieutenant here with the West Palm Beach Police Department Okay. The chief would allow me to keep my certification and keep working so I didn't lose it. Wow. Okay. Very lucky. All right. Um, before we go any further, why it's just... Well, we need to get to the end so I can ask you a question almost. Um, so, you were data now, and you said for five years? Five years. Another five years. Mm -hmm. And um, just tell me one more memorable, or, or even two more memorable experiences while you were the executive director for a drug abuse treatment association? I think all about the drug abuse treatment association. The success was seeing how dedicated the staff was trying to work with these kids because it was easy to fix the kids to stop them from doing drugs. Mm -hmm. The one thing we couldn't affect was the environment they were coming from. Right. And that was always disheartening that we couldn't change that environment. The parents were using more than the kids were. Uh, the kids that they were hanging out with at school weren't the best role models. So you had all of this going against you. 
It was almost to the point that we wanted to keep those kids as long as we could to make them as strong as we could before we had to send them back out. Even though they were that outpatient after being with us. On mm -hmm. the, it, I think that always just stuck in my mind that, that um, I went to Congress. I testified in front of the Select Committee of Narcotics and Drug Abuse. Tom Lewis asked me to come up. Mm -hmm. And he goes, what can we do in Congress? I said, would you just do a pie and break it up into three parts? Give one third to law enforcement. We understand you got to stop the drugs. Mm -hmm. Put another third into prevention. Why not work on the demand? And then if you put another third into treatment, we might be able to make headway. Mm -hmm. But right now, you want to just put all the money into law enforcement. Bang, bang, shoot them up, break down doors. Mm -hmm. And then a, a drug dealer told me once, he goes, you guys are riding it all the wrong way. If you can w get rid of the demand, the supply will go away. It's that simple. It's business economics 101. And, uh, and I strongly to this day still believe that. And we still are not doing it in this country today. Mm -hmm. We're still not doing it. Okay, um, what was your next job? Uh, sheriff uh, Bob Crowder was the sheriff in Martin County. Huh. He won the election. He called me up and said, would you leave data and come and be my major of administration. Mm -hmm. I want to turn my agency around. Okay. I said, I'll do it. So I went there for four years. While I was there, I started the second boot camp for troubled kids in the state of Florida. Okay. And the boot camp um, was a six-month program. We took troubled boys. These boys already had some felonies. Mm -hmm. and we put them in a boot camp environment. And their grades were terrible, but by the time that we finished with them, they were getting straight A's. Hmm. So it told us that these kids weren't stupid. They just weren't motivated to learn. So they were getting straight A's. Um, they were very disciplined. Uh, their parents didn't recognize them anymore when they came home because they'd make their bed, um, clean the bathroom, do all kinds of things that we were teaching. Again, what hit me there was, again, we're sending these kids back to an environment that might be difficult for them to adjust to after what we have done with them for six months. Um, all my drill instructors at graduation would wear mirror sunglasses. Okay. It looked like you're pretty badass, but they weren't badass because they wore those glasses because every single one of them would tear up and cry at graduation when those boys were leaving. Mm -hmm. Many of them had a, would always say, what's going to happen to my kid? They, they just took it that to heart that it does work. Did work. Nice. Did nice. Was that your final? No, heck no. I love working around all kinds of jobs. Keep so going. At the end of four years, <laughs> Bob Newman became sheriff from Palm Beach County. He said, I want to bring you back. You know, you, I did used to work there for a little bit. And he goes, I want you to start a prevention academy like you did in Martin County. You mean the Palm Beach County Sheriff? Yeah, uh -huh. so I did. I, I went in there as a captain, mm -hmm. and I started the Eagle Academy out in Belle Glade. Okay. And uh, from there, I did uh, two, three years, and then the city manager in Pahokee said, would you ever think of leaving the sheriff's office and come be a, my chief of police? Okay. Chief Salvatore's retiring, we'd love to have you. So I did. Went to Pahokee, mm -hmm. and I became chief of police. And uh, then the sheriff's office made a bid to take it over, and I really didn't want to go back there. So came home to Palm Beach Gardens and went to work at the Gardens Mall for 11 years. Really? Yeah, I was head of safety and security at the mall. Nice. And then I said to my wife, I love you, but I'm not working anymore. I'm just going to do Kiwanis and volunteer. <laughs> and she agreed. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Your overall experience, well, first of all, even on vacation, while you were in, from the military to like right up to the minute, we know you were in Massachusetts, I uh, know you've been to Texas, you've been to Lackland, I know you've been to Asia. Um, what other places have you traveled or visited over the whole, the entire course since you entered into the service? Um, well, we did get to go, I did get to go to Japan on R&R &R from, from Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that always intrigued me, mm -hmm. Japan. Um, you always, I was growing up, of course, you heard the bad things about Japan because they attacked um, our country. And, of course, my father fought in World War II. So uh, the, it wasn't a positive learning experience about Japan. So I loved doing that. Um, so I went to Japan. Um, Where? Uh, um, Tokyo. Uh -huh. Went to strictly Tokyo. Um, 
been to Paris, France for a while, just uh, you know, for vacation. I like to immerse myself in the culture. I like to learn the food. I like to learn the language. I like to learn their history. Uh, I just don't want to be a sightseer and take pictures, you know. Right. I want to be more, have a little bit more of that. The one thing that was tough for all of us Vietnam vets when we came home, and I came home from Vietnam and Thailand when we landed at Travis Air Force Base, um, we were told to take off our uniforms, take a shower and put on civilian clothes. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really understand why. Mm -hmm. um, and they said because if you wear your uniform traveling in the United States today, you're going to be called baby killers. You may be spit on. Uh, and we were kind of like uh, isolated from that overseas. You know, we didn't get to watch news clips and right. and all that stuff. So that was something that... What year was that? That was 1970 when I came home. And it was true. There were protesters outside Travis Air Force Base. Um, but we kind of had short hair. You kind of still stuck out like a sore thumb. People would walk up to you and go, Hey, did you go to Vietnam? And most of the time we lied. Not that we weren't proud of serving our country. Right. We just didn't want any hassles. And yes, exactly. Like you know, kind of affection for a while. So France and where? France. Where I've been to France, Belgium, uh -huh. um, Italy. Mm -hmm. um, the wife and I have always felt that traveling outside the Americas has always been uh, great. And we've enjoyed that. Right. Is that about it for the travel? Yeah. Okay. All that. right. Um, burning question, actually, because um, I understand that you have a a very lengthy, very lengthy part of your civilian career after the military has to do with social services, and I notice I don't know. Well, anyway. The PTSD is a term that was created, I, I believe, because of, um, you know, people who are in the military. However, I'm just, I'm just curious to what your opinion or your take as, well, your professional opinion, actually. Um, PTSD, it, it, it would appear, and correct me if I'm wrong, is something that can be experienced without going to war. If, um, you know, the community that you live in if there's a lot of, uh, I'll, I'll call it instability, so to speak, um, and you, as, as a law enforcement officer, you have a, an extensive, um, you've lived it. So, not so much to talk about the problem, but the solutions. And, and I just want to say, I want to compliment you on um, the trip that you took to Washington, D.C. to speak to speak about it. That was Washington, or was it Texas? Washington, D.C., yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, Congress. again, um, the, with the, that very background, I'm, I'd like to get your, your stance on, on what you think solutions would be in, the, in these critical situations. Well, I think the first thing has to be that everybody has to recognize it. My personal opinion, professional opinion, is that anyone in combat, police officers, firefighters, nurses, doctors, anyone that has to deal with any type of trauma has PTSD and will have it forever. It doesn't go away. You can't, I wish you could say you could wipe these memories away. You can't. Now, <clears throat> in society, we try to like, well, let's put a percentage to it, see how bad it is for you. I don't think you can put a percentage on PTSD. From zero to 100, everybody's got it. Mm -hmm. Do some deal with it differently? Sure. You can deal with it differently. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the number one flaw is that it needs to be recognized. And it needs to be understood by everyone that doesn't have it. Because a lot of times you don't understand what someone may be feeling and going through. So it, it's, it's a topic that I strongly believe everybody should know what it means, what it is, and how it affects people. In law enforcement, if an officer shoots somebody, no matter if it was deserved or accidental or wrong, the minute that bullet leaves that gun, PTSD starts. We used to say that, well, we'll let you go talk to the chaplain. The chaplains are great people, but they're spiritual and religious. Sure, they're great listeners and understand. Mm -hmm. But that officer, uh, firefighter, nurse, doctor, uh, soldier, they're going to need a little bit more than spiritual guidance. No offense to chaplains or the spiritual community. Right. But a lot of times, 
the ones that I've always talked to that have the PTSD and they understand that you understand what it is, that's who they want to talk to. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk to a, a wonderful psychologist that did, you know, went to college, got a great degree, wonderful. <clears throat> but you sometimes have to walk in other people's shoes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, to know how the mind works. Mm -hmm. So I think you, your question was, it needs to be recognized, uh -huh. and we need to educate, and not just respond when it happens. Okay, um, last couple of questions. Um, oh, so besides the BFW, uh, Kiwanis, you mentioned Kiwanis. Kiwanis yeah. uh, any other organizations you belong to, uh, community-wide, or military, veterans? Um, I, I belong to the VFW, of course, and I belong to the American Legion. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I was also exposed to Agent Orange in Thailand, uh -huh. so I've, I'm, in, I'm treated by the VA hospital. And I have to say, this VA hospital here in West Palm Beach is, is just five star. Right. They have given me, and I've watched them give so many veterans the help that they need. So when people badmouth the, the VA system, mm -hmm. sure it's got its flaws, sure right. it's got its bureaucracy, but... Um, they do, they, they, they do a bang-up job. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Um, the one thing that I loved about the military, and I still do today, and that's why my grandson, my stepson, mm -hmm. uh, my nephew, have all gone into the military. Okay. Be and they ask me why, and I say it's the basic training. I hate to say drill instructors yell at you and get in your face, but they have to break you down mm -hmm. to build you back up. Mm -hmm. And you get to see things in a different light, maybe than the way your mom and dad raised you, mm -hmm. so, or your grandma, or your grandpa, whoever. But that, I think, um, has been the most rewarding part of what I did. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, the Native American drill instructor I had the second night sat us down on bunks. He said, you're going to go in town in a few weeks for your little one day, and you're going to see a lot of people there protesting, maybe spit on you, mm -hmm. and disrespect the flag. He said, please understand this. You are not here to defend the flag. You are not here to anything but that. You are here as a soldier, an airman, to protect the rights of, of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That is our foundation, not the flag. Not, not the song. None of that means nothing. It's a piece of cloth, and then it's, a, it's some words with music. But how you act every day, and how you believe in what we stand for as a country, that's what you're here for. Okay. And I, oh, that has stuck in my head and not gone anywhere. Last question. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, the one thing that it taught me was diversity. I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, um, and I, I just learned, I don't know why, but the military taught me diversity. They were all the same. That was one thing good about basic training. Nobody was different. You all get treated the same. You're all going to be treated the same. At that moment, as an 18-year-old, I realized that there were other people, different cultures, uh, different ways they were brought up, different parts of the country, but today in this barracks we're all one. And why not have that the rest of your life? Why not experience oneness with everybody? And that again carried me through law enforcement. I thought gave me a different sense of being a law enforcement officer and what that meant in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I sometimes, uh, shall we say, went, had I was at odds with a lot of my fellow workers in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I wasn't of that mentality. But again, the military taught me that diversity, and we're all one and the same. Uh, the blood's red, everything's the same. We feel the same, we hurt the same, we cry the same, we love the same. So I'm sorry. Uh, it, I always felt at that time everybody should go in the military, boys and girls. Right. And, and go through basic training, go spend... If you don't want to carry a gun, you could work at the VA hospital cleaning bedpans. Mm -hmm. But I think at some point we have to learn to serve our, uh, why we have what we have today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that was a great, great interview. 
Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? No, I just, um, I guess I'm uh, pretty happy and pretty proud mm -hmm. of what I was able to accomplish and do. You know, from my dad telling me he got 30 days to get out of the house <laughs> was probably the best thing he ever did to me. <laughs> okay. okay, well, I also want to thank you for your service. Thank you. Yes, sir.